And I got a call, an interesting call, uh, not from a surveyor, but he was an industrial valve technician. He worked at an industrial valve plant and specialized. That's all, his, that's all he'd done pretty much his entire life, and, and, he, and he wasn't that old. And he said, um, hey, he goes, there's something really strange about – I'm going to tie this in with what, what you said, Jason, which is the ISS. And, and you can uh, – well, I'm going to tie you into what I think you're going to talk about, circulated air. And he goes, he goes, you know, there's something really strange about that. And he goes, every submarine – he goes, because we – he goes, the industrial valve sector is, the, uh, is really tied to submarines. We deal, you know, because somebody has to make them and we have to make them. And he goes, but – he goes, even no matter what we have to make it, and confirm this or deny this right off the bat, he goes – Every submarine has a full-blown machine shop on board to make adjustments to things and, and make pieces on the fly because you're underwater. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Drill, drill presses, lathes, the whole nine yards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the whole nine yards. He goes, because some of those valves are very, very, you know, the tolerances are very tight. And he goes, he goes, last time I checked, you don't have a full-blown machine shop on the ISS. He goes, what are they doing for their seals? Between compartments, and he goes, and he goes. On top of that, there's uh, there's lubricants for the seals. He goes, how what what equipment? He goes, you you, you know, because uh, machine shops are extremely heavy. You know, they're just huge blocks of metal. He goes, how 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 would you even put those in there? Where would you do it? Who's working on this stuff? He goes, it, it doesn't exist. He goes, that the ISS could never function as long as it did with with the equipment they're using. Yeah. You, and you said you because I you mentioned because you wanted me to remind you uh, that you guys don't pop up for, to circulate your air uh, very often. Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't know a whole lot about the ISS. This this is a whole recent revelation to me. I, I didn't give. Yeah, but well, compare compare yeah. it to a submarine because he was. Uh, but with the, how long has the ISS been about been up in space? Long time. <laughs> Years. <laughs> Okay, well, here's the thing. Yeah. Uh, not only do they have to deal with either the, the atmosphere or the lack of atmosphere around the ISS, mm-hmm. but they have to manage the difference between that atmosphere and the atmosphere inside because you, you can only, uh, uh, like, like on a submarine, we can only draw our atmosphere down to a certain pressure to where it becomes... Uh, dangerous for the people inside all right because you have to have atmospheric pressure at a certain level it's like you know climbing a high mountain you go up to a certain altitude uh yeah you have the same percentage of oxygen in that air but the atmospheric pressure is so low you're not getting the uh the cubic feet per per minute or cubic inches per minute of oxygen into your system yeah, like commercial commercial planes will set it because I had an altimeter on my watch uh, when I was traveling, and they set it between four and well about thirty five hundred and five thousand feet, mm-hmm. roughly in the interior pressure. Right. Yeah. Uh, now with the ISS, here's what happens when you when you have people in an enclosed area, they off gas certain uh, uh, contaminants. Carbon dioxide um, is is the biggest one. Yeah. You have equipment that gives off carbon monoxide. Anytime you have anything heat producing, you're going to make carbon monoxide. Mm-hmm. Uh, you use up uh, oxygen. Uh, if I remember correctly, the human body, we use about 0.83 cubic feet per hour of oxygen. Okay. Right? Uh, now, a submarine, you have to calculate that for that. So if you're not going to be recirculating your area anytime soon, and you get your oxygen level, down to a certain point, normal levels about, uh, I think it's 20, 20 and a half percent. Mm-hmm. Our, yep. low, our low tolerance level on a submarine was 17%. Mm-hmm. All right. Usually when we started to get down around 19%, we would do an oxygen bleed. Now, from what I understand, they have oxygen generators on the ISS. Okay. Okay. They, they claim they can make oxygen. All right. Now they're okay. going to have to make oxygen at a rate of 0.8 three standard cubic feet per minute or standard cubic feet per hour or greater mm-hmm. just just to keep up with the amount of people that are breathing it sure they have 10 people on board they're going to have to make oxygen or bleed oxygen into the into the atmosphere at a rate of 10 cubic feet per hour standard okay. cubic feet per hour or they're going to die okay i mm. can make enough oxygen um 
Let's see. Now, along with with the oxygen generator, in order to make oxygen in an oxygen generator, you just can't put regular water in there. It has to be purified water, mm-hmm. okay? uh, because it's uh, the process is called electrolysis. We pretty much run a current through the water, and it splits the the hydrogen and the oxygen. Correct. Completely. You take the now now you've got hydrogen, okay? Yep. Hydrogen, uh, you know, left all on its own, filling spaces is a bad thing. It's an explosive. Yeah. So now you got to harness the, ox, the the hydrogen. So I want to know how they're h- harnessing the, the hydrogen up there. And then you got to pump it overboard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now with with all this is said and done, if you put people in a contained atmosphere, over time, the atmospheric pressure is going to lower because you're pumping, uh, you, they have their CO2 scrubbers, carbon monoxide scrubbers, and all that stuff on board. Mm-hmm. What they're doing is they're cleaning the air, and they have to get rid of those contaminants. And you got to pump them overboard. It's the only way you can get rid of them is pump them overboard. Yeah. So over time, you're pumping these contaminants outside of the, the people tank, and over time, that lowers the pressure. So I want to know, over all these years, how are they keeping that pressure up? They can't be doing it, which is pure oxygen. Yeah. 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 Good point. And, and if the um, – let me throw one more at you. And that is if this system, which sounds way more sophisticated well, – okay, the short, short version is why aren't the – why isn't the United States military using this for the submarines? If it's so great, if you can actually stay up, you know, if they can stay up there for years, because you guys have to surface every once in a while to swap out air. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And But they're not, ever. So why isn't, you know, and the military has a great budget from what I hear, why wouldn't submarines be retrofitting to these things a long time ago? And, and, and they, they actually supposedly use some of the, the same equipment that we've used on submarines. Their atmosphere monitoring system. Is well, the, yeah, but that's... The exact same thing we use on submarines. Yeah. Uh, but where are they getting the fresh air? Yeah. Can't be being flown up to them all the time. You know, <laughs> Dragon and SpaceX doesn't make a flight every few days, you know. It, it, it only lasts so long. It, yeah, and I can confer with that because I, I already know what he's referring to with the 20% thing. Yeah. You could have any gas-free engineer that served in the Navy come and talk to you about that. It's all about per- percentages, and if they just keep dumping contaminants out, they are depressurizing their cabin every single time they do it. And just the simple act of hydrolysis isn't enough to put enough pressure back into their, their enclosed cabin. It's well, just I not. Think, I, think, I think they put all that pressure back in when they use all that hairspray for the women. <laughs> oh, you, I, <laughs> yeah, if you guys haven't watched, I don't know if you've watched any of the <laughs> ISS. Uh, yeah, that's brilliant. You know the one that I liked that again I, you know we everybody misses the most obvious thing was he goes he goes wait where are the hatches that are between the segments he goes every every in a split, in a thing like that where it's you know it's supposed to be airtight he goes he goes where are the freaking doors between the sections because either they were there and you took them out and you chucked them or they were never there to begin with which means if something goes wrong in any part of that station you know the Everyone's smallest dead. Yeah, the smallest hole, those guys mm-hmm. walking around their khakis and their polo shirts, yeah, they're doomed. It's like, and which, that's a whole other thing. It's like, why are they going around in khakis and polo shirts? But wait, wait, wait. As far as atmosphere, when we're talking about atmosphere, like our, our atmosphere here is 80, 81% nitrogen. Yeah. So uh, they, don't, they don't fill the cabin with nitrogen as well, do they? Oh, good point. About, about 79% nitrogen. Okay. Yeah. Usually 20.7 oxygen and then uh, minuscule amounts of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and argon. Right. Yep. And can I, can I just say something real quick? Yeah, kind of go ahead. On that? Um, I've done a lot of research on the ISS. Um, I know Jason hasn't had a chance to yet, but uh, not only to mention the pressurization thing, you know, they act all nonchalant and, you know, decompartmentalized spaces that are just all arbitrarily connected together, all while flying around 17,000 miles an hour, with the doom and gloom of, you know, thousands and thousands of micrometeoroids slamming into you, having that risk every single hour, and they're just walking around. 
Like yeah. nothing's dangerous. And, you know, I'm not making this up. This is their claim. They claim that, you know, <laughs> thousands and thousands of tons of micrometeoroids are flying through the, uh, close to our atmosphere every single day throughout the year. And they're slamming into the moon and they're never supposedly like running into the ISS ever. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. You saw you saw that piece of crap film. I mean, it was cool for the graphics, but uh, Gravity, two thousand thirteen. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sandra Bullock. Yeah. I mean, not yeah. only was she lucky. I mean, talk about a movie where crap's flying all over the place, and she's making it. You know, by you know, fourth and in inches, always always making it right past the danger. Yeah. But um, like you said, yeah, why should they be scared if they're filming it in a studio or deep under, uh, you know, in some big tank and. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's well, that's the Apollo argument, which most people don't even don't even talk about, which is forget about all the the camera techniques and the lighting thing and and the you know, lack of gravity and the wires and all the crap that was used on the Apollo stuff. It's the attitude that bugged me because these guys are walking around. I mean, every time they fell, I'm going, man, if I fell in a first time usage spacesuit for like this on the ground, I would be scared to death that someone was going to puncture my uh, (laughs) my. And, and, you know, they're playing golf. They're driving around in mood buggies, none of which we saw got put together. And they, were, they couldn't have been. They were singing, doing all this fun stuff. I was going, the only thing I would be thinking about on that moon is mission, you know, whatever my mission is. How do I then, not die? <laughs> yeah, how do I not die and get the hell out of there? Because you, you would never be that nonchalant. But, yeah, like you're saying, in a studio, that it starts to take over because you, you're, you're, you're kind of cracking jokes, kind of like an outtake reel on a real studio. Because those, yeah. that's, the, that's where the fun stuff happens. Everyone's like going, yeah, yeah, you know, because they know no matter what happens, they're going to live through it. It's, it's not a big deal to them. And they, they should have edited all that stuff out, and they didn't. Yeah, and people criticize us. You know, I've read some of the comments on the uh, interview that I've done. Mm-hmm. You know, I expected it, but people want to criticize us for believing what we believe. Just imagine this, America. Your taxpayers' dollars every year go to a bunch of clowns that pretend they're in space and they're just all nonchalant about it. Never once has anyone ever taken a satellite picture uh, of an upside down city from the perspective of space. Never once has anyone ever been had the open you know, commercialization of space travel. SpaceX talks a good game, but we're apparently going to be going to Mars by, you know, like 2020 or some, you know, science fiction bullcrap like that. Yeah. You you just look at it. Look at the attitude that runs behind it. Look at the people. Like, go out and do this research yourself. Look at who founded NASA. Look at all the order of progression of what happened from NASA's 